Welcome everyone and hello. Uh, we will start with the webinar. Uh, so uh, it's exactly uh, 10 a.m. So uh, let's start. Welcome to Tetra's third webinar on angel investments, grants and alternative financing. My name is Kirsten and I'm your moderator today. Uh, I'm a project manager of Tetra and on a daily basis I work with startups and innovation projects in Civita. So before we get started, I would like to <clears throat> give a short overview about the project. So Tetra is a business accelerator for the next generation internet and we organize boot camps, trainings and a series of online events such as today's webinar. To those startups and researchers who get funded by NGI, Tetra will offer business support to help them bring their ideas to the market. We organize six boot camps in different countries. Uh, the first, however, will be held online due to the current COVID-19 situation. Uh, but we also hold webinars, provide individual mentors for the teams and help the teams to build connections with investors and other stakeholders. But before we get started with the webinar, I would like to uh, introduce our guests. First, we have Riva Anton, an angel investor, entrepreneur and founding partner of United Angels VC. After that, we have Kadri Adrat, an expert on grants and funding for SMEs from Civita. And last but not least, welcome to Ramona Tremluga from Altfinator, a project that helped to improve the access to alternative financing in Europe. So each guest will speak for approximately 15 minutes and we will leave 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So please write your questions to the Q&A uh, section on the left side and we will answer all of them after the presentations. So now I would like to give the floor to uh, Riva who will uh, give an introduction to Angel Investments. Yes, thank you. Uh, and hello from my side as well. Uh, as told, my name is Riva Anton. Um, I've been doing angel investments for the past around maybe 10 years. And the last three years, I've been actually a fund manager for a fund called United Angels uh, VC. Uh, maybe briefly um, about what I've been doing um, as an investor. So um, I started doing early stage tech investments, as I said, around 10 years ago. Um, this is my current portfolio. Some of those companies are um, in my angel portfolio, but the others are uh, in the funds portfolio. I've been focusing mainly on, on B2B concepts, but there are also some other uh, B2C companies. Um, over the period of, of, of time, I've, I've done more than 30 investments and um, and looking at maybe around up to 300 uh, 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 companies every year. Um, in my portfolio, there's one unicorn uh, uh, so far, but actually there are two to three companies which, which are on their way to become unicorns maybe within the next uh, one or two years. Um, Going on uh, to maybe uh, today's uh, subject. Uh, first of all, if if one considers uh, uh, attracting investments from investors, um, you should keep in mind that actually this is a very expensive way of uh, financing a company. So um, looking at different opportunities or, or different instruments, grants obviously is the most uh, cheapest one because you know maybe you will need to. Uh, you know, uh, use a consultant or do some reporting, but all in all, grants are kind of like presents. So, so these are quite cheap to um, uh, from from the founder's point of view. Secondly, you could use loans. Uh, loans are of course more expensive than than grants, but all in all, you know, they are temporary financing, which means that you will pay back whatever you 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 took in as a loan plus the interest. So. Uh, it's also like rather cheap way of, of uh, financing a company. Uh, but thirdly, if you attract an, uh, an investor who will take share in your company and, uh, and uh, be there for a, quite a long period of time, this is actually the most uh, expensive way of financing the company. However, you know, 
often enough, especially in early stage and in tech investments, uh, loans and grants are not available or are just not available in the amounts needed. So therefore, um, uh, investments or investors become uh, important and, and many companies uh, are going that route. Um, so I'm going to do a, a, a short overview today about how the investors uh, usually make their decisions and what are the key aspects they are looking at. And on the next slide, uh, I think this is the most important slide actually in my in my presentation, you can see uh, maybe a decision tree a typical professional or semi-professional investor would use. So it's definitely true for the investment funds and it's also uh, probably true for more experienced uh, angel investors. And uh, investors are not investing into your ideas, but they are rather investing in you, which means that, you know, the early stage investor activity is very founder centric. And on this uh, decision tree, you can see that it starts uh, with, uh, with asking questions about the founder. And let's follow the tree on the left side. So uh, first of first question, is it the also founder? If yes, we could also analyze the market. If the market is good as well, attractive one, we could also ask if the founder and the market have a good fit, meaning that, you know, maybe the founder has worked in similar uh, area before or, or he has uh, or she has some sort of like uh, good knowledge about the market. So if there is also a founder and market fit, investors could actually uh, consider investing into an idea as well or in the idea uh, phase, meaning that you don't have a product yet and you don't have any revenues. However, if the founder and market fit is not that good, uh, most of the investors would would look for some traction, meaning that they, they want to see some data on uh, product market fit. Uh, <clears throat> now let's let's see what what, what else might, might 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 happen according to the decision tree. So there's an uh, awesome founder, attractive market, uh, but the market doesn't seem that good. So that means that the founder would need to compensate what the market uh, is, is lacking, meaning that the founder will need to be like really top notch. And if this is the case, maybe most of the investors would still be open minded. If the founder is not really like, you know, one of the top you can uh, find on the market, probably it makes sense to, uh, to pass this opportunity since uh, it's clear that the companies are not actually shaping the markets, but the companies will need to adapt wherever the markets go and markets always win. Therefore, you know, uh, a good founder, but a non-attractive market probably will not be a good, uh, good fit or, or uh, investment opportunity. Then going to the right side of the, uh, of the decision tree, uh, you know, many investors say that actually with, with, with this graph, there's no need for the for the right side. However, let's 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 go th uh, through it to for, for you to understand the importance of the founder. So, uh, if the founder is not good and the market is not good, of course, the obvious uh, answer would uh, would be not to invest into such a project. Um, then again, when the the founder is not good, but the market is like really attractive, you know, growing really fast maybe no competition at all, then actually maybe some of the investors might be open-minded uh, uh, when they see a lot of traction. So if you would have a product market fit, uh, they could really consider investing. Uh, so it's all about the founders really. Uh, but um, um, throughout my, my, uh, my work as an investor, we have developed uh, um, like a four category um, or, or uh, the, the four aspects that we are uh, uh, looking at when, when looking at the uh, prospective team. And I will uh, shortly introduce all of those four. So first of all, uh, the business. So um, often enough, I see where, where, uh, where entrepreneurs are coming with their ideas, but they have not really 
thought of it as a business, but they rather see it as a product. And the way uh, investors operate is that they actually want to invest into concepts that they, that can become assets at some point of time. So how did how, how the evolution usually goes is that once you have a product uh, and you start attracting early customers, you will have some revenues, and slowly it becomes a business. Meaning that you know you are still like a centerpiece of of all of it, but maybe you can already cover some of the cost. But you should also you know see somewhere in the future that actually you can cover all of your costs, earn. Uh, uh, profits and maybe the organization will grow uh, to a stage where you are not the only person who can really run it and therefore you know the concept becomes an asset so the investors really want to see how your idea becomes an asset which they can sell at some point of time because remember uh, the uh, relationship with the uh, investor is a long-term one but it's still a temporary one um, then um, Many investors are um, uh, vertical focused, say they are looking at ideas in food, uh, I don't know, crypto, B2B, uh, fintech, whatever. So uh, you will need to know uh, whether your idea actually meets uh, the investment focus of a particular investor. Many investors want to invest once there is a product, meaning that you would have a minimum viable product, uh, preferably with, with some early revenues and some traction. Then all of the investors always want the IP, intellectual property matters, to be ad properly addressed. And in tech, of course, everybody are looking after scalable uh, uh, business models. What we also do, we always ask uh, feedback from uh, industry professionals or industry experts. So we try to have uh, also uh, a second opinion from someone who might really know the vertical where the uh, prospect operates in. So business is the first aspect uh, investors usually uh, look at. Secondly, and most importantly, the team. Um, and I'd say that, you know, probably this is like maybe like 70% of the decision. Uh, first of all, as I told before, investor and, uh, and entrepreneur relationship is a long one. So typical uh, holding period for early stage investments is uh, seven to nine years, which means that, you know, this is more or less the course of time when you will need to kind of like uh, be together with the, with the investor. And therefore, personal match is very important. Um, secondly, it's, it's statistically so that uh, multiple founder teams are more likely to achieve good results than, than uh, single founder teams. Of course, exceptions exist, and probably it's better to have a really good single founder rather than you know, many founders, and none of them would be particularly good. Uh, building a large and successful company is actually like an extraordinarily hard thing to do and therefore probably only extraordinary people can achieve something like this and therefore investors are looking um, uh, for certain characteristics uh, in the entrepreneurs and uh, Sometimes you can you, you, you can understand if it, this is an extraordinary person by looking what they have done before uh, you know, maybe they are very good in some sports, maybe they're really good in math, maybe they did a PhD, maybe they uh, wrote a book, whatever. So you would, you would look for uh, characteristics which stand out in those people and, 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 uh, and this is something that really proves that uh, if the person has done something really well in the past, probably they, they could do it again in, in even another area. Uh, carrying on uh, to market, so uh, <clears throat> typically we also uh, uh, look at uh, the markets and uh, we in, in United Angels VC, as, as told, we, we are uh, focusing more on B2B businesses which are very common for, uh, for Nordics, but uh, maybe more um, kind of like uh, 
general uh, things to, to, to analyze would be if uh, the particular business could become number one uh, in the particular niche they are uh, uh, working in. And uh, this particular niche should be at least 100 million. So uh, in many cases, you, you see good entrepreneurs and, and nice businesses, but they're just operating on very small markets. And therefore, it will be hard uh, for investors to have uh, returns. It's uh, because, you know, the companies are just not growing enough. And maybe uh, which markets are more attractive? Usually these are the ones that are growing really well. And, uh, you know, if the market growth rate would be higher than 30% a year, that is kind of like a good sign in terms of the market growth. Uh, carrying on uh, with the last uh, aspect that we do analyze, and that is uh, terms and exit. Uh, uh, so uh, first about the terms. Uh, so we would always uh, try to benchmark and see if the valuation of the company kind of uh, meets our expectations and if our uh, ticket size is also relevant. So maybe, you know, in a later stage, companies would, would only accept investors with uh, minimum 10 million ticket size, uh, then obviously this is not for us. And then we look at some uh, more legal terms, such as uh, uh, if it's uh, possible for us to uh, invest also in uh, uh, next rounds uh, to protect our shareholding position, which is connected to pro rata rights. Mm, uh, we often want to invest together with other investors uh, and therefore also look uh, for syndication opportunities. And finally, as told, this is a temporary relationship and investors want to exit at some point. So we always try to see what are the exit avenues for us. And if there are some exit partners that, uh, that might be interested in, in such a business concept we're analyzing. And uh, also sometimes you can... Uh, uh, investigate uh, sort of transaction activity in the particular vertical. So, for example, if you know that in fintech there have been a lot of transactions lately, probably there will be also exit opportunities. So, I guess I'm almost used my uh, 15 minutes. Uh, so, that was very shortly about uh, how the investors are making their decisions and maybe one thing to remember is that the founder and the founder team are the single most important aspect in making the decision. Thank you. Thank you, Nivo. And I will also urge all of you to ask questions in the Q&A section, uh, which we will then answer uh, at the end of all the three presentations. So next up, I would like to give the floor to Kadri who will introduce uh, funding opportunities to boost your business. So, uh, Kadri, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kristen. Um, uh, hello to everyone from my side as well. So, I'm going to very, very briefly give you an overview of the different uh, funding possibilities there are, that are out there. Uh, as Kivo said, this is one of the main ways to uh, get quite uh, cheaply the money you need for your uh, uh, business ideas or your development ideas. So let's see what we can uh, or what kind of uh, possibilities are there. Uh, so in the first uh, slide, I will have the EIC accelerator. And uh, when we go to the uh, uh, main aim or the main topic of the EIC accelerator, then uh, it is meant for uh, businesses or SMEs who have very innovative, disruptive, novel uh, development ideas, <clears throat> who would like to do something that has not been done there before, or even if there is a market uh, segment already established, then uh, the idea should be completely different and better than uh, any other um, competitive idea out there. Um, yeah, European Commission looks for high risk um, and high potential SMEs to uh, summarize uh, it up. 
Um, when it comes to EIC Accelerator, then there are no set topics. All kinds of uh, ideas and SMEs can apply for. What we have seen, however, during the last years of the uh, um, successful projects is that uh, usually the Commission is going to uh, prefer or uh, rate higher the ideas that have a tangible outcome, meaning a hardware idea rather than a software idea. Uh, the funding consists of two different uh, parts. Uh, you can apply only for grant, which is up to 2.5 million and with a uh, financing rate of 70%. And you can also apply for uh, blended financing, which is uh, consisting of the grant part and equity part. So basically from the European Commission, you can also get equity investment up to uh, 15 million euros. Um, to continue, then, uh, what is it uh, that you need to be successful? Uh, the uh, application rounds for EIC Accelerator are very competitive, and uh, there are a lot of um, SMEs who apply for the grant, um, and only a few or only a small amount are uh, successful in the end. Uh, do you understand? Uh, what is needed to be completely successful or, or to get high rates from for your proposal, then you have to understand that uh, the evaluation is going to be made in uh, two phases or two parts. Um, first one is remote evaluation where um, four experts are going to read your proposal and provide uh, uh, scores for the different parts of your proposal. And the experts can feel from very different uh, uh, fields of activity, very different backgrounds, very different locations. So uh, you have to aim for the impossible goal to uh, please everybody without even knowing who is going to read your proposal. So the important part is to uh, provide a storyline um, with uh, the problem that you are going to solve. Uh, with the potential solution, how are you going to solve the problem, and then the action plan on uh, how, what are you going to do in order to solve uh, the problem or uh, reach your solution. Uh, usually the problem should be uh, at least uh, on a European level, whether they are societal, environmental, um, also business challenges, but uh, they should have a wider impact. Um, and in your proposal, you should always uh, prove um, the challenges, prove your solutions, uh, use as much as uh, uh, possible data, facts and figures in order to point out that uh, all arguments that you say in your proposal have a very solid background and are uh, uh, reliable. Uh, when it comes to uh, remote evaluation, then uh, the experts usually have only up to two hours to read your 30-page uh, proposal. So uh, it's not that much time. Thus, it's important to have the proposal as visual and as easy to read as possible. So uh, more proof and talk, less technical language, more uh, easily understandable uh, schemes, tables, um, visualization. It makes it easier for the evaluator. And um, yeah, that can um, be a major factor when it comes to the scoring of a proposal in the end. Um, from your background, you should point out the strong team. So the uh, EIC Accelerator does not have any kind of preconditions to the SMEs who are going to apply for the funding. However, you, you should uh, showcase that you already have a strong team, um, at least uh, in the core level, meaning that you have a strong and competent uh, CEO of the company. You have someone who is uh, very knowledgeable and competent in the technological field of your project. Uh, also, sales and marketing is very really important as the uh, wider goal would be to um, boost the uh, success of your company and make it grow after the project on a wider scale. Um, usually, in Europe, at least in European scale, not, uh, or even better if it's globally. 
So uh, during the proposal writing, you should already try to showcase that the team is uh, there, at least on the basic or the most needed level. And yes, of course, the idea has to be something that is not currently out there. So pointing it out, showcasing, emphasizing it in the proposal is the, one of the most crucial things. The second phase of the uh, evaluation is uh, interviews. And uh, there you have to be prepared to present your idea basically to investors. So you have to be um, ready that uh, the members of the jury are investors mainly. So sell your idea as good as you can and be, uh, be ready to uh, answer all questions that um, the investors uh, may, they, may ask you during the uh, presentation about the forecast, market traction, etc. Uh, so, when it comes to the application process, uh, then uh, it requires a proposal, which is up to 30 pages, annexes, and uh, there are several cut-off dates you can apply for during the year. This year, uh, one cut-off date is uh, left, it's uh, 7th of October. Um, the funding scheme is going to definitely continue next year, we just don't know yet the cut-off uh, dates. Uh, when you continue to fast track to innovation, then uh, it is quite uh, similar to SM EIC Accelerator. It's also meant for SMEs. It also looks for uh, groundbreaking innovations, uh, something novel, something new, uh, what is up there. And uh, the main difference when it comes to the topic of the yeah, funding scheme is that uh, fast track to innovation is a bit more uh, uh, tech focused. So they already say in the uh, guidelines or in the uh, initial uh, uh, introduction to the call that uh, more uh, tech uh, focused uh, projects are expected. The grant size is up to 3 million and uh, funding rate is uh, for businesses or uh, private uh, sector companies, 70%. Uh, uh, the main key success criteria are uh, that you have to have a consortium. So here you cannot apply uh, alone. You have to have uh, partners, um, at least uh, three partners from three different uh, EU countries. And you can have up to five partners. The uh, proposals or the projects are meant to be industry intensive, meaning that uh, a larger part of the partners have to be uh, private companies. And when it comes to the activities, then you can uh, apply for uh, piloting test beds, um, validation in real world uh, conditions. So basically you can apply for uh, funding your idea uh, starting from prototype to uh, up to market uh, reach, so a ready-made product. Uh, the proposal uh, or application process is also rather similar to the uh, EIC accelerator. The main difference is that here the scoring or the evaluation of the proposals will be done on one phase. It's, it's going to be only um, remote evaluations. So only reading your proposal and uh, scoring based on that. Otherwise, uh, the main expectations are pretty much the same. Uh, for fast track to innovation, there are at today's stage two deadlines uh, left. One is in the beginning of June, which is uh, rather soon. Uh, and the second one, or the main, mainly realistic uh, one, will be in the end of October. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you would be interested or if you are interested in applying for Fast Track, then uh, the October deadline is something that you can go for. Uh, cascade funding. Cascade funding is uh, uh, slightly different from the 
previous funding schemes, meaning that here the European Commission has already provided uh, funding to some uh, large scale uh, project who now in turn is going to fund smaller scale projects uh, within the implementation of the large scale project. So basically uh, different uh, beneficiaries of uh, e European funding will um, provide money to SMEs. As you can see in the, here in the slide, then there are very different uh, topics that are covered. So um, uh, you can apply for uh, different funding uh, possibilities in very different topics. Uh, the funding amounts or the grant sizes are also very different and depend a lot on the project uh, who uh, divides the money or provides the money funding. And um, there are some uh, deadlines that have already been uh, um, have already passed, but there are also some that uh, are still coming this year. So uh, it would be um, maybe useful to look into those. Uh, the proposals uh, can be quite easy; they vary a lot. So there are some proposals, uh, or then some. Uh, guidelines for the uh, proposals that are more difficult and uh, there are some that uh, are more easy and are completely doable by companies themselves. However, uh, cascade funding is uh, a funding scheme that is uh, less uh, competitive. So for smaller uh, companies or SMEs who are maybe also younger, it's uh, uh, easier to get the initial funding that you might need. Uh, so we have, or I have two topics uh, or two main funding schemes left. Uh, these two, uh, meaning the LIFE program and then uh, R&D funding uh, later on is going to be more um, uh, yeah, research focused. Uh, life program is uh, something that is uh, uh, focused towards environmental issues. So here you should uh, uh, develop new technologies, new um, approaches to uh, uh, basically uh, solve environmental issues, whether it's waste management, uh, uh, air pollution, um, uh, CO2 emissions, etc. So there are different fields. However, all the uh, projects have to be um, meant to uh, solve environmental issues out there. A uh, life program consists of uh, two uh, sub programs. One is climate focused, one is uh, uh, environment focused. So here in this slide, you can see the main areas or the main targets. Uh, that uh, are meant uh, in both uh, sub-programs or what are expected in both uh, sub-programs. Um, in life program, you should not have a, uh, you are not required to have a partnership, but it's advised to have, especially when you are a SME, then uh, um, involving a larger company in order to uh, show the relevant impact uh, expected from the program is, is uh, needed. And uh, in life, the uh, funding rate is uh, up to 60%, so it's uh, smaller than in uh, Fast Track and in EIC Accelerator. And the last part is uh, R&D projects. So basically here uh, uh, are meant the Horizon 2020 projects or uh, work programs that deal with uh, uh, very different uh, aspects or very different topics. And as you can see on the slide, then the, uh, all the um, different fields or topics have their own uh, targets, their own budgets that are going to be uh, divided. Um, so it's it's a quite wide scale uh, uh, funding scheme or work program out there. Uh, the types of projects are uh, different. Um, on the uh, next uh, slide, you can see that uh, uh, research and innovation projects are there. 
uh, innovation actions are there and uh, coordination and support actions are there. So what is the main difference uh, between fast track and, and EIC and uh, these Horizon 2020 programs is that here you need uh, definitely a consortium. Um, the minimum amount is uh, three uh, different partners, but actually uh, usually the partnership consists of uh, 10 up to 20, 30 partners. So uh, quite vast uh, uh, partnerships. And here in this case, uh, basically uh, you, an SME can participate as a project partner. So usually the leading partner of the project is a university or another R&D institution and then they involve SMEs in order to uh, so that the SMEs would uh, yeah just choose some task uh, from the project uh, cover some field of the project um, yeah and in uh, in these horizon uh, projects uh, there are several uh, open topics or uh, it's uh, the topics are based on the uh, different uh, fields of activities. So here the uh, calls for applications are very, um, yeah, they are uh, restricted with topics. So here you, you should actually give a, uh, uh, a lot of attention on what is expected in the project that uh, you are trying to apply for. Here on the slide, you can see uh, the open topics currently out there, but it's uh, the list is always or, or uh, constantly changing as new calls are published. So it's something that uh, you just bear in mind and uh, in, in the form of partnership, it would be, might be a good idea to go for uh, these large horizon projects as well. Uh, so this was the last slide from uh, my part. Uh, thank you, and uh, I will give the word back to Kir Kirsten. Thank you, Kati. And before we give the floor to Ramona, our last presenter, I would like to also tell you that we will share all the slides uh, after the webinar, and we will also send you some additional information uh, on grants and different funding opportunities. So moving on, I would like to uh, give the stage to Ramona, uh, who will uh, introduce uh, alternative financing options available. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, yes, as the last part of the session, um, I will give a brief overview of the alternative finance and some tools that can help you find the most suitable financing options for your business. So that by the end of my talk, hopefully, you will have a better understanding of how you could benefit from different types of finance, which is basically the goal of this um, session, obviously. Next. To start with, I'd like to introduce a network named Alphinator, which I'm here to represent. So the network combines financing organizations, consultancies, universities, associations, and other parties interested in improving uh, SMEs access to finance across Europe. And actually, if you're one of those organizations wanting to make a difference in your region, you're welcome to join as your country representative. So uh, please contact me afterwards. Uh, but first, let us look at the context in which uh, Alphinator started a few years ago. Next. Most businesses in the European Union are small and medium enterprises, and so their success directly influences the economy in Europe, large scale as well. However, the, um, the difficulties they face in getting backed by banks uh, are due to the extremely innovative ideas, which seem to be risky, uh, their low credit scores, and the short financial history of their business. Next. At the same time, there are many alternative financing options available, as you've heard by now. However, only a small percentage of SMEs in Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe have access to the capital they need to grow their business. So there is a major gap in the financial ecosystem throughout Europe, while some regions face bigger barriers and more problems than the others. Next. While Southern, Central and Eastern Europe face issues with uh, attracting funds in alternative means, uh, Northern and Western European financial, financial markets are much more mature and they can show a way to, uh, for the developments needed in the rest of Europe. Next. 
as the result of ecosystem mapping and looking at the conditions needed for enabling a better financial ecosystem, three problematic areas can be pointed out. The main problem lies with the lack of knowledge in specific countries that are lagging behind, which cause trust issues in any new finance options alternative to traditional forms of finance. Next. Whether awareness and trust issues are the cause or the result of those rigid systems uh, currently available, any kind of developments are hindered by a non-supportive regulatory framework from which transformation could actually begin. And this is where Alphinator stepped in. Next. Alphinator is a network, but also an information hub um, whose free of charge services I will introduce to you a bit later. Uh, but the core aim of uh, its uh, activities and existence is to help European SMEs by giving free access to knowledge about alternative finance, but also for uh, by connecting ecosystem players that can make the difference um, and change happen, both virtually and physically. So leaving the regular regulators aside for now, I'd like to bring out a simple storyline how Alphinator can contribute to finding more successful uh, transactions and uh, so that more transactions could be made uh, with alternative finance in Europe, looking at it from the business owner um, and finance provider side. This is actually a part of our uh, promotional video that you can see in full extent um, on our channels as well. Next. Sophia, for example, is an entrepreneur. She learned about equity for crowdfunding at an Alphinator webinar and knew that this was the perfect choice for her business when she heard other SME owner talk about their experience with a crowdfunding platform. Next. After having talked the plan through with her business partners, Sophia joined the Nekidi crowdfunding platform where investors are offered shares in the company for in return for their investment. And her startup received the funding needed to grow the business and manage to scale in a couple of um, years to come. Peter here on the left is a venture capital fund manager, always seeking new ideas and companies to invest in. Next. By engaging with the platform provided by Alphinator and signing his company up for the matchmaking tool provided, he became more accessible and visible among uh, European entrepreneurs that he didn't have access to previously. And thanks to the connections built virtually with the SME seeking for finance, through Alphinator platform, he was able to find new projects more easily that fit to his company's vision or um, for the companies that they wish to support with investments. Next. Apart from connecting the ecosystem virtually and perhaps in a rather passive manner in that sense, Alphinator has grown into a network and an intermediary that actively initiates discussion and knowledge transfer between regulators and associations that can support developments in the region. Next. I'll come back to Alphinator's benefits for you in a moment, but before I do so, a few words about alternative finance as such and how it differs from traditional finance. Next. The very simple difference between traditional and alternative is the amount of people engaged in that activity um, and with whom your company will have business connections with as the result of the trans, uh, transaction and the responsibilities that come along with the decision to let them invest into your business. In traditional finance, a larger investment is made by one or more parties. Next. In alternative finance, smaller investments are given by a group of people interested. So as mentioned, it can be difficult for small companies to get bank loans. And this is due to the limited options provided and uncertainties that uh, with the company that the banks are not used to um, take or willing to take. Um, for example, the paper uh, paperwork with um, these kind of uh, investments is uh, long as the investor goes through the strict requirement details. The approval process is multi-leveled and takes more time, therefore. And what is most relevant, the credit score of the businesses are highly prioritized to bring out a few of the aspects. Next. Quite the opposite to traditional finance. Alternative finance is much more ag agile, if you could say it so. It focuses on the idea of what is being funded. Uh, and less about the company background if you consider crowdfunding, for example. In addition, uh, the payment terms and the types of payments made can be influenced by the company owner. And the approval rate is uh, rather high in comparison to traditional, at least. And of course, there is always the risk of not getting the funds needed and uh, not having total control over the process. But alternative finance certainly gives more flexibility into the process. Next. 
Even though Europe is behind U.S. and Asia regarding volumes raised in the alternative finance market, investments made to companies through alternative uh, finance forums are growing consistently. According to Statista's um, data from this year, the market reached a uh, 10 million, 10 billion, 10 billion sorry, mark in 2017, and 18 billion uh, worth of transactions were made in Europe already by 2018. So, um, as you can see, the funding rates are highest in the UK, um, but a few uh, Nordic and Western countries follow with uh, after a, a big lag. Um, and the countries are actually known for their effective self-regulation in the market um, and the kind of discussions they hold between the service providers, companies and regulators, um, engaging all relevant parties that can enable uh, transformation in the ecosystem. And as mentioned, China leads the sector um, and their uh, market exceeds uh, the one in the UK, for example, 3.5 times. Next. There are many options to choose from and what exactly to go with really depends on the type of uh, company you have and also the requirements you have uh, or are willing to take in relation to involving investors. Next. And today I'd like to highlight a few that our network has focused on and for which the platform provides additional information about. Next. So zooming in on crowdfunding, the core criteria needed really is um, an idea in need of funding, people interested in investing into this idea and a platform to facilitate to the, the transaction. And as mentioned, the opportunities are varied and even crowdfunding has several options which cater different needs. So looking from the perspective of investors, the options can be divided into two, considering whether the investors expect a monetary return um, and whether you as the business owner are able or willing to provide that, or if they are happy to support your company in exchange for a product that you provide or just as a donation. And the decision of which type of a crowdfunding campaign to run for your business is therefore also guided by your business idea and your company stage. Next. There are many aspects uh, which help to decide which option is best for you. Here I've highlighted the ones brought out by the uh, European Commission, um, but most relevant is to consider the product you have as mentioned. Um, does it make sense to ask for investors contributions in, in return uh, for your product, ask for it as a donation, or to provide them a share in your company. And this largely depends on the stage in which your company is. Next. A good opportunity to get to know more about the, how the platforms work and what would be, would be the best for your company is to see the materials provided on our pla pla platform, such as uh, webinars about different types of finance. Uh, these recordings, such as the one that we had on invoice trading earlier this year, uh, combine the perspective of the service providers as well as the SMEs that have the experience of running campaigns on their platforms. So the webinar recordings will give you an overview of how the platform works um, as well as uh, how to set up a campaign so that it uh, turns out to be successful. Next. This takes me to introducing the Alfinator platform that we've prepare, prepared in the network for sharing the materials and knowledge uh, available and created. Next. Um, so, as mentioned, the platform serves as an information hub. Uh, we have varied information materials available, starting from uh, the webinar recordings I mentioned and other explanatory videos, um, but also fact sheets and reports uh, that are more detailed about the specifics of uh, different kind of instruments, but also manuals for investors uh, that are really straightforward and, and um, short for uh, better effectiveness. Uh, next, but today I'd like to highlight one of them, uh, which is the matchmaking database um, that I could see you uh, benefiting from the best. Next, um, and here's a screenshot of the website that you that you'll see next, and the tool that I would uh, introduce to you um, is the matchmaking tool. The name itself can be slightly misleading. Uh, but the core of this is to help SMEs and finance providers in their regions um, to find each other or in their target markets that um, consider each other's needs and uh, would be suitable, suitable for each other. Next. 
And here's an overview of how it works uh, if you wish to filter uh, the um, search function. Otherwise, you can see uh, an interactive map that highlights how many opportunities we provide in our database in your region or the target regions you seek for. So uh, please do go and take a look at it in, in case you're interested in finding investors from Europe. But um, you can filter based on the type of a, uh, an investment that you're looking for. And there we also provide a very short uh, overview of what the investment um, uh, type means. Uh, so a short, uh, a small glossary there as well. Then you can specify the amount that you wish to raise um, and the locations that you are interested in. So the locations will provide, um, will specify the companies that either uh, are from your region or um, provide their services in your region. Uh, and as last, you can cho choose the development stage in which you are in. And of course, you don't have to choose um, all, of, all of the filters to keep your cho choices uh, more available. And at the end, if you provide your email, you can receive those uh, an overview of the companies that will suit your company best, in, um, in our opinion, uh, to your email. And for finance providers, uh, they can sign themselves up for the platform to uh, gain more visibility among the SMEs that uh, find our platform. Next. Uh, and as last, um, in addition to having the platform, of course, it doesn't run by itself. And the network that has prepared it um, is continuing its work with uh, by engaging more organizations relevant to um, improving the system and, uh, and the regulations related to alternative finance. Um, and the network, as I mentioned, uh, welcomes other organizations interested in um, supporting the develop developments in their region. So um, do contact us if uh, you wish to be a part of that. And that's actually all from, uh, from my side. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Ramona, and also thank you to all the other speakers. Uh, so we will now answer the questions that we have received in the Q&A section. And because we have a lot of attendees, then uh, bear in mind that, uh, that uh, you can only uh, write down your questions in the Q&A sections. So first question, uh, whether in Tetra Bootcamps participants will receive this kind of insights according to their business idea. Uh, considering that this question came in quite early, I would uh, think that this is about uh, investment readiness. And uh, yes, uh, because in the bootcamp, we will have uh, 30 teams in one bootcamp. Then the investors, coaches and mentors can work with the team separately. Uh, and um, there is more time for uh, to concentrate on certain teams needs. So next up, we have a question for Rivo. Where or how should startups look for angel investors they want to approach? Rivo. Yes, thanks for the question. Um, typically, most of the countries have actually um, business angel networks, and they also have established uh, processes like how to approach those networks and how do they um, present different um, uh, investment cases to their members. So I think the first opportunity would be to reach out to um, angel investor networks in your country or uh, region. Um, another opportunity is actually to participate in different pitching events where uh, uh, angels regularly uh, participate in. And thirdly, of course, is, is um, I think a good opportunity is just to reach out to those angels direct. Uh, I don't know, sending an email or giving a call. Um, sometimes, of course, it's better to uh, to reach out to them through an intro. Uh, and uh, and definitely, you know, a good intro can be done by some other investors. So I would say that maybe you know the hardest thing to do is to. Um, Find the first uh, investor who believes in you, and you know they can already recommend you to other uh, investors and do the intros. Uh, thank you for the question, Eva, and greetings to Slovakia. Thank you, Riva, for the, uh, for the answer. 
So the next question is from Ricardo, who's asking whether uh, you need to send your email to rece receive the presentation and additional information uh, about grants. Uh, no, you don't need to send your email because we uh, have your emails that you register to this webinar with. Uh, however, if for some reason you won't receive this information, then you can also write us an email uh, on info at tetraproject.eu. I will also put it on the slide later on. So next uh, question is uh, directed to Ramona. What is the most accessible alternative financing source for a startup uh, pre-seed or seed? Ramona? Yes, thank you. Uh, I would say crowdfunding is, or rewards-based crowdfunding is the best option, uh, especially because uh, the funds given by the investors don't have to be repaid. <laughs> you just uh, deliver the service or the goods that you promised to. Um, and orders, uh, if to talk about the reward-based and not the donation-based donation um, crowdfunding, uh, the orders are secured for your business even before launching a new product. Uh, so it allows you to build your customer base with it, which is basically like an additional uh, point of value for your company. Uh, so yeah, in my opinion, that's the that's the best way to go. <laughs> Thank you, Ramona. Uh, so a question to Rivo. Uh, what exactly does awesome founder mean? Is it his or her personality, or are there any other characteristics? So, uh, yeah, very good question. Thanks. Uh, I think it's a mix of of, of uh, the personality and the experience. So, um, often enough, of course, you know, people are are maybe curious about uh, experience. That you know, there are many very young founders who also tend to be uh, successful. So um, as I told during my presentation is that I think usually investors look uh, or, or seek for um, uh, experiences uh, that the founders have had in their previous careers or studies that would just uh, make them to stand out. I mean, maybe you're doing a fintech company uh, but you were like extraordinarily good in, uh, I don't know, sports, for example. So actually the investors can be quite sure that usually people who are good in sports, they're very persistent, which is also like a very important characteristic in, in entrepreneurship and building a startup. Or I don't know, maybe someone was very good in uh, math, for example, you know, then you could uh, maybe consider that, okay, Probably if they're good in math, they might be like really good coders as well. So you, you are basically just looking for uh, different events in founders' lives or, or periods of time where you can see that they have actually the characteristics uh, that uh, would make them uh, to stand out uh, from uh, the rest of the people. Thank you, Rivo. So now we have uh, quite many new questions here. So first up, uh, can Ukrainian startup take part in your in our programs? I presume Tetra programs. Uh, Tetra programs are only uh, the webinars and online uh, events are open from for everyone. But the bootcamp that I mentioned previously is only available for next generation internet beneficiaries. And you can become one if you apply for an open call and more information can be found from this presentation and the additional information that we send to you. Can you use the services of Alternator? Yes, they are free for everyone uh, on their website. Uh, and you will also find more from the presentation that we sent. There is uh, the website to Alternator uh, and so on. So next question. Uh, uh, is from Vladimir and he has he says that he has a question to all of the present presenters but Vladimir can you maybe then write your questions here to this to this section or if you want you can also send us an email uh, with your questions and we will be happy to reply you by email the next question is from Matis uh, they are, say they are very interested in exploring life funding. 
Uh, and to Mathis, I would say as well that uh, more information about life uh, will be in the additional materials that we will send uh, to email to all the participants. And if you have other certain questions, you can always uh, contact Kadri, uh, send her an email. Her email was also in this presentation uh, and uh, I'm sure that she will be happy to reply. But as our time is up and I have some uh, final remarks to make, then unfortunately we cannot take any more questions right now. But if you have additional questions, then you can uh, write us on info at tetraproject.eu. But we, I would like to introduce our next webinars um, that we have coming up. So a next one, as Riva mentioned, that IP is very important for investors' point of view as well. Uh, then uh, the next webinar that we have coming up on 17th of June is an introduction to intellectual property for NGI community. So everybody, all startups, uh, we recommend you to attend. And after that, on 1st of July, we will dive deeper into uh, AEIC Accelerator that Kadri was uh, introducing in the beginning of her presentation. So more information can be found on our website, which is business.ngi.eu, uh, and you will find a list of webinars there. And also in the beginning, I mentioned uh, at the bootcamp. The bootcamp is for next generation internet funded projects. You can already apply and the first bootcamp will be held online uh, at the end of September. More information as well on our website. And during this bootcamp, you will get, uh, work with mentors and coaches. And you will get training uh, specifically based on your needs on IP, equity funding, marketing and sales, pitching and a lot uh, more. So if uh, we didn't answer your questions today or if you have more questions, then get in touch with us at info at tetraproject.eu. As I mentioned, you will receive all the slides and also additional information on uh, funding opportunities. And feel free to send us your questions and we will be happy to reply you on, uh, on your email. Thank you, everybody. That concludes uh, the uh, webinar. Thank you, thank you to all the presenters and thanks to all the participants. I hope that this was uh, very useful for you. And I would like to end the webinar here.